Thank you so much for um, asking me to be here. I'm very pleased. And the things I have to say tonight, the words are going to be much easier to pronounce than what I've heard so far. <laughs> so um, a lot of the times when I'm meeting um, with a family or a patient, the first thing I always get is, what do I eat? And if I don't get that, the um, patient is very frustrated with the caregiver, or the caregiver is very frustrated with the patient. Um, because the caregiver is showing their love through food and the patient doesn't want to have any more of that love because they don't feel hungry, their taste is off, um, you know, they have a lot of nausea and all the, the GI symptoms that can come along. So it's a very frustrating and, and complex situation. So I, I try, to, try to work with everyone and, and see what we can do. Um, to make sure that that person, the, the patient, can still continue to eat and maintain their muscle mass, which is really important, and get the nutrients they need to help support them through treatment. So instead of me just uh, doing a lot of talking, I wanted to throw in a couple questions to make this a little bit more interactive. So to get us started, the first question is, um, which of the following foods are good sources of phytochemicals? And we're going to talk about what that is. So the, the answers are A, red meat, B, tilapia, C, fruits and vegetables, and D, dairy. Anyone brave? C. Correct. I'm going to have to make these harder. OK. So she's right, fruits and vegetables. So, so what are phytochemicals? Well, that's a really technical word. So what I tell people, it's a unique health benefit. Every single type of phytochemical has a unique health benefit to you. And one of the examples that I like to give, because, because we see it so much in um, our food that we eat, is beta carotene. So beta carotene is that orange color that we see in different um, vegetables. Um, and I'll tell you an interesting fact about it in a minute. But beta carotene actually converts to vitamin A when you eat it. And so vitamin A is really important for vision, it's important for growth and development, but it's really important for immunity, which obviously affects um, this population. So um, the interesting thing about beta carotene is it's that orange color, which we've already said, so we see that in our sweet potatoes, our carrots, um, butternut squash, things like that, but there's also a lot of beta carotene in all your dark leafy greens, your spinach, your kale, and that's because um, everything in food comes bound together. So beta carotene is your green color, and it actually comes bound, sorry, beta carotene is your orange color, and it actually comes bound to your green color. So the green color is masking the orange. So that's why you don't see the beta carotene in all your dark leafy greens, but it's there. And for that same, for that same reason, beta, beta carotene is, I thought I wasn't going to say difficult words, but I guess not. So for that same reason, um, beta carotene, for it to be best absorbed, it really needs to be chopped so we can break it apart from the other chemicals that it's bound to, the compounds it's bound to, or we need to heat it, um, chop it and heat it, either way, but we need to break it up a little. The other thing is because beta carotene converts to vitamin A, vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin. That, that means your body best absorbs it with fat. So you would want to have maybe saute your spinach and a little bit of olive oil, um, something like that, so that the beta carotene will be well absorbed. So that's just one simple explanation. There's so many of these phytochemicals and unique health benefits in all your food. The one thing you don't want to do is say, um, if this is great, then more is better. We see that you know, all the time with food. And so you, we, I wouldn't recommend that if beta carotene is so good that you go buy it in a pill and you just supplement with a lot of it. Um, there's something called a symbiotic relationship, which means that if I'm eating a cherry, it's probably just not the red color um, that's the, the compound that's healthy for you. There's so many compounds in that cherry, so you want the whole food. Okay, you don't want to get everything in, in um, a supplement form. You want to eat everything in a whole form, all your food together. So um, 
that is what a phytochemical is, and so that's why I always encourage people to have color in your diet. And you've, you've probably heard that before, but I cannot say it enough because it's so important. So what I tell people is to look at every meal and does it have color? So if I'm having breakfast, can I add blueberries or strawberries to my oatmeal? Um, if I'm making eggs, can I add some vegetables? If I'm having a sandwich for lunch, can I add some extra lettuce, tomato, vegetables on the side? And so really color comes from the ground. So I also tell people, whatever you're eating, make sure it's grown from the ground. Because um, wherever there's fiber, there's color. And anything that has a lot of fiber is grown from the ground, and that, that also has color, your fruits and vegetables. So that, that's going to be really important. Um, and so there's a list here of all the different types of non-starchy vegetables that are full of color. All right, the next question, which foods are rich in antioxidants? So A, blueberries, B, spinach, C, strawberries, D, all of the above. Yes, that was good. That was good. Again, I, mean, I think I need to make these harder. But yes, obviously, you've heard so much about this before. So uh, what is an antioxidant? To, to keep it very simple, it, it helps prevent, I guess you would say it helps prevent against cell, cell damage, and that's good. So blueberries, I think, are very common. We all know that that's a, we hear that as being an antioxidant. But your dark reds are great, too. So again, any sort of color in your diet is going to have benefit to you. Um, so there's a list here of an antioxidant grocery list that are things you should always be looking for when it's in your grocery store. Okay, so those, that's color. We always want that in our diet, but um, that's on a good day. What about a bad day? What about when someone's going through treatment and they, they tell you they just don't have an appetite? You know, what do you do then? So here's another question for you. Which of the following can help with loss of appetite? A, rely on hunger cues. B, eat two large meals per day. C, eat smaller, more frequent meals throughout the day. Or D, eat dessert at every meal. <laughs> You're correct. Um, you can have some dessert. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to let him share this note that just was passed to me. So, <laughs> uh, you shouldn't be passing notes in school, sir. Okay. So, um, so the answer was actually C, eat, eat more small frequent meals. I really, um, when I have interns with me, I actually try to get them not to say this <laughs> because um, small, more, more small frequent meals, that's a very general, it's very general verbiage. You know, what, what does a small meal mean? What do frequent meals mean? So really, if someone's not hungry, what I want them to do is when they do eat, have a low volume of food, so a small amount, but a lot of calories and a lot of protein, so they don't feel overwhelmed. So, you know, if your loved one doesn't has lots of appetite and you bring them this big plate of food, how are they going to feel by having to eat that plate of food when they're not hungry? Not good. So we work on what are small things you can eat but have a lot of calories and protein. You know, and, and my go-to is always a peanut butter and jelly, you know? Um, yeah. And, or some French toast or um, uh, I think of some other things. But those are things we work on together is eat a lot of small things um, but high calorie and high protein and always have snacks on hand. So that's the other thing that we were alluding to earlier. I brought everyone um, a Mayo Clinic lunch bag and because I really tell patients that if you're going to have long days at the hospital um, or the clinic getting diagnostic tests, giving blood, you really want to make sure you're not without food for too long, especially if you're someone who's been losing a lot of weight chronically. So always keep things on hand. My other go-to besides a, a peanut butter and jelly is trail mix, you know, trail mix, heart healthy fats, a lot of calories in a small amount. You can add some sort of um, dried fruit to it that you like. Again, a lot of calories in a small amount, always have food with you. So you're always prepared. Um, okay, so the other thing with loss of appetite is um, 
You don't have hunger cues like you used to. When you had an appetite, food was fun. You wanted to go out to eat, you wanted to socialize. Food, food was a fun thing to do, but when you're not hungry and you're not feeling well, um, you don't get something that tells you that you're hungry. You don't get that feeling, so you can't rely on it. So I tell people, eat on a schedule. Just like you're, if you're going to have to take your meds at 8, 12, 6, whatever it is, that should be the cue to you. I need to be eating something also. Um, the other thing is um, we, we hear a lot about protein shakes, protein drinks. That's the one thing I don't want you to do. Well, not, you don't have to do anything, I say. But um, I would recommend not doing with your meal. And that's because if you, if you have a protein drink with your meal and you're not hungry to begin with, you're going to fill up on the fluid. And then you're not going to eat much food. And then we're back where we started. So really, I recommend eating food at meals. And then as a snack, have some sort of protein shake. So this way, we're always supplementing calories and protein all day long. That's going to happen hopefully get us to our goal of where we can at least maintain your weight. Um, so I think that was that. And if I'm running out of time, just let me know. Okay. So, um, okay, we talked about, we mentioned protein. So which of the following is an example of a high-protein snack? A bagel with cream cheese, oatmeal with peanut butter, Greek yogurt with berries and granola, or a sweet potato with butter and brown sugar? Greek yogurt, yes, excellent. So um, most Greek yogurt, depending on the brand, has about 12 to 14 grams of protein. And the, this number is pretty important, and what I tell my patients is, um, if you're gonna have protein, I, I generally recommend at least 20 grams. And I say 20 grams per meal or snack. Um, because most, most people who aren't hungry, they're not eating meals and snacks all day long. But really, um, it's that 20 grams that's important because your, your body's getting, let me say it this way, I always compare it to a box of Legos. So everyone has, you know, you, you've been a kid or you have a grandchild and you give them a box of Legos. Um, but I tell them, what if you're giving your grandchild a box of Legos to build a dinosaur, but that you only gave them 25% of the Legos? What would the dinosaur look like? Wah, wah, you know, yeah. So um, that 20 gram number of protein is important because it's going to make sure you get all your Lego pieces so that your body gets that signal to say, hey, I have what I need. I can start either maintaining my muscle mass or hopefully build some more. And then if you're moving on top of that, that's great. Now we're maximally stimulating um, growth of muscle mass. So that 20 gram number is important, and you can get that through food. So that's three to four ounces of chicken or fish, turkey, um, eggs. One egg only has six grams of protein.